Today we're talking about hobbies and it's my pleasure to have Peter Simpson with me again. I'm Andrea Salmon, one of the Education and Wellbeing Program Coordinators and Peter is from Assistive Technologies Australia. So in the spirit of reconciliation, we start our, all our programs with an acknowledgement where we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past, present and emerging, and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples with us today. I'm, I'm in Victoria and Peter's in New South Wales. So wherever you're joining in from today, we hope you join us in acknowledging the traditional custodians of our country. Peter is one of the technology mentors at Assistive Technologies Australia. And on the next slide, we'll explain a little bit more about ATA, but it's great to have Peter bringing his lived experience of adaptation and equipment and different approaches to the way we can continue doing the things we enjoy doing. So Assistive Technologies Australia is a wonderful organisation that brings together a whole range of equipment and assistive devices, pieces of technology, adaptations to make life easier, to enable people to continue doing the things that they enjoy doing and need doing, despite what might be getting in the way. So the contact details at the end of our slides, but you can go to ATA for advice, to tap into their expertise and to get some training as well. So make sure you check out their website and get a whole lot more detail about what they can offer. And as I said, contact details are at the end of the program. Today we're talking about hobbies. Now, you would all be aware that we all have different hobbies and different things that we enjoy doing in our downtime. And really the main aim of today's program is to highlight that there is help, advice, different approaches, all sorts of things available to ensure that you can continue with your hobbies, even if your symptoms of multiple sclerosis get in the way. Last time we looked at gardening. So if, you're, if gardening is your hobby, you might wanna check out that webinar recording and find out all the things we talked about around keeping up with the garden. Hobbies, hobbies provide us with an outlet from our daily stressors, and they can also keep us from getting burned out in our jobs. And when we're no longer working, it's our hobbies that are the things that help bring us purpose and help fill our day. There are also numerous health benefits that come from having a hobby and from having things that we enjoy doing. Benefits like lowering our blood pressure to better physical functioning, higher positive psychological states, and even less memory loss by keeping active with some of our hobbies. So we wanna pose the question, what do you like to do? And we'd love to hear that from you. And also thinking about whether multiple sclerosis has impacted on your hobbies. Maybe you've picked up new hobbies along the way or you've changed the way you do things. We'd love you to pop that in the conversation area. I also hope that you've had a listen to some of the conversations that we've had and are recorded on our website, particularly with some of our people with MS who are artists. They're inspirational in the ways that they have adapted and changed the way they, they complete their art and that they still are engaged in their artistic pursuits. Having a hobby that we enjoy brings us joy and it enriches our lives. It gives us something fun to do in our leisure time and it gives us the opportunity to learn new skills as well. And the social connections that come from a hobby cannot be overstated. But sometimes MS does get in the way. And like we have looked at previously, I've just chosen four areas of symptoms that people with MS might experience 
that might get in the way of hobbies. So that could be your balance. Maybe the hobby that you enjoy doing requires good balance. And if your balance is impacted, you might not be able to stand up for as long or moving around might become more challenging. But maybe you can look at doing the same hobby in a different way and maybe sitting down is an option. Some hobbies require strength, some hobbies don't, but some hobbies require strength. And if your strength is impacted, perhaps you need to look at different ways of completing the activity, whether it's a piece of equipment or whether it's getting someone else to help you with that hobby. Then there's the whole area of our dexterity, being able to continue using our hands when they're not working just quite like we'd like them to. And maybe, maybe there are interesting and unusual options. We wanna just pose the idea that you don't have to give up on your hobby just because you can't do it in the way you've always done it. There are alternatives available. And then there's the big one of fatigue. And I'll talk a little bit about fatigue partway through the, the program. But fatigue really does try to get in the way of everything. But we really, we just need to perhaps look at the way we do things, break things up in a different way, pace ourselves, because there are ways to keep going and keep doing the things that you enjoy doing. So Peter, I thought I'd pose to you some of the um, hobbies that people might be enjoying and looking forward to keeping on going and to get your ideas on some of these hobbies and some of the equipment and the pieces of technology that are around to help. So if it's okay, can we start off with fishing? Absolutely, thanks Andrea. So I know a lot of people out there, myself when I was younger, I used to do a lot of fishing, whether it was with, with my grandfather or my dad and it's a pastime. A lot of people still like, like to doing but but may not necessarily um, have the be able to physically do it to the same extent that they used to be able to. So what I've done is I've just selected a few a few technology options that we've looked at and that are out there on the market to help with people actually be able to go and, and fish, whether it be with some assistance or um, um, on their own. So when it comes to fishing rods, they've, I've chosen the first product I've chosen here is actually a powered fishing reel. So a lot of people may have strength issues in relation to casting a rod, but not only casting a rod, but particularly once the fish is on the hook, being able to, to reel, that, reel that fish back in. So um, this is one powered fishing reel that I've chosen, which is the Electromate powered um, fishing reel. So this is a um, a fishing reel which you actually attach your, which actually attaches to your fishing rod unit that actually um, assist in trolling, casting, drifting and, and the bottoming out of the fishing line as well. And it can be mounted to a fishing pole or um, you can actually attach it to, to your wheelchair as well if you want to attach the wheel and that to your, chair, to your wheelchair as well. But, and you know, as I'll talk with a lot of these products, there's a lot of different types of products on the market as well that do a similar thing. So what I've chosen is just a very small sample of, of what's out there. So if a lot of people can do their research online and, and find a particular piece of equipment that might be, that, that, that is best for them. And then that last picture on the right hand side is actually of a fishing harness. So this actually, this harness actually has adjustable shoulder and waist straps. So this particular harness, as you can see, is a cylinder pipe at the front for holding a fishing rod. So you place the fishing rod into the end of that pipe and it will actually provide a little bit of stability for you. So you may not, you may not want to use this standing up either. If you have balance issues, but you still want to use a, a harness such as this, you might, you, you might like to use it sitting down rather mm. than standing up. This sort of device particularly is probably more for somebody that has decreased arm strength, for example and has trouble actually holding a fishing rod or exerting pressure when there's something on the end of that roll, on the end of that roll. And also something like this would be good for people that have tremor issues as well, um, and be able to hold in the rod if they have hand tremors and things like that. Something like this will actually help hold it steady. 
Absolutely. Another piece of equipment too that will actually help with with particularly hand um, hand and finger dexterity use is actually a strong um, another another fishing rod, rod holder. But as you can see on this picture, this actually wraps around and attaches to the user's forearm. And then the rod actually gets placed within, um, gets wrapped around the, the, the rod and the forearm. Um, so it's used to enable a person with limited or no grip to firmly support a fishing rod. So this might be something that, that you might want to look at using as well um, to, help mm. you at, to help you actually hold hold on to the rod and, and, and not drop. When it comes to wheelchair devices too, the second one is actually a wheel, a, it's a fishing rod holder. So there's many, many, there's many varied um, types of fishing rod holders on the market. This one that I've changed is actually uh, specifically for the power wheelchair option, which again, um, if you're somebody that, that that's fishing and you may, you may actually have a support worker with you that actually helps you in the whole process of fishing. So this wheel, this this rod can be can be put into the side of the wheelchair. You may you may put it in the chair for rest, for example. So I know well, I, I know myself. A lot of people, you know, when we go out fishing, we're going out fishing for hours on end, and and we've got the the line in the water, but nothing is biting. So rather than sitting there holding on to the, to, to the rod or, or sticking it into the sand like a lot of people do, this just allows us to keep it at arm's reach and actually just put it, attach it to a wheelchair, you know, in a wheelchair holder in our chair. So this can be mounted to the side rail of the chair. You can also get different types of products similar to this for manual wheelchairs as well. And also products that will attach to a, um, a seat or a stool, for example. So this is just one example of, of the types of, of, of rod holders that are actually um, out on the market. I, trouble. I know a lot of people have trouble threading hooks, actually putting a hook on the end of a line. Um, I know mm. I do. Um, and I mean, even if we even if we don't have issues with with hand dexterity or or with our eyesight, for example, just generically. Um, Fishing hooks can be really hard to attach to totally. the lines. Yeah. So, um, this, so this is actually a line threader that that helps um, um, small to medium hooks. So, um, there's actually um, a number of videos on YouTube. If you um, search this, uh, the the name of this device, there's plenty of um, videos on youtube that will actually show you how it works fantastic um, while i was looking there's actually quite a few different types of of hook threader devices on the market as well so yep. if you're not comfortable using this particular one there's other products on the market as that's well that's great peter that, that just it also straight away really points out that sometimes we we lump the whole activity i can't fish anymore but actually it might be that there's one component of the process that is the difficult component. And so it's a matter of thinking about what could I do to overcome that issue. If we move on now and think about what a lot of um, people enjoy sewing and knitting, I think that's perhaps the same thing. There are components of the activity that might be causing the problem and maybe we can break it down and think about which part of it is difficult and is there a gadget? Well, I know so, sewing is, is quite a popular pastime for a lot of people. So when it, when it sort of comes to sewing, I know a lot of people have um, um, issues with um, threading needles, for example. Things with needles can be a little bit tricky. So this first device, which is, is actually an automatic needle threader, so this will actually um, thread large needles. So the needles, actually, if you can see in the, in the picture, the needles actually placed into the um, the right hand side of the device, and the actual um, and the actual thread is actually put into the side of it. And what will happen is by sliding those wide buttons across, it will actually thread the the, the thread into the needle. So this is. This is actually quite a popular device that I've actually seen, I've seen at a lot of websites around um, mm. that a lot of different companies sell. There's a couple of um, other different types of styles of needle threaders as well, but this is just one of the ones that we're um, that's on the market. 
The next one we'll move along to is actually a crochet and embroidery loop holder. So I know a lot of people when they're crocheting or, or um, embroidering or even knitting might have issues with actually holding, um, for example, in this case, the, the embroidery loop actually in, in place. A lot of people sit it on their lap or on a table, but you may not. You may need something to support it, stop it moving around. So this one is a is actually a table now, which is used for knitting, um, crocheting, embroidery, and and darning as well. So the last one I chose was actually sewing cabinet. The reason why I chose this sewing cabinet is because it's actually um, it's actually on casters. So this particular um, sewing can be moved around to different locations. So rather than taking having to get your sewing equipment and move it to another area of the lounge room for example to sit down you can move this cabinet around to whatever location you choose to to sit and sew in whether it be the lounge chair or the um, um the dining table for example or you may may you may get a support worker or or a family member or somebody to move it for you into the the, into the preferred location where, where you're going to to save for that particular time so so yeah that's a really good cabinet again there's a lot of different sort of cabinets and and um, and modular units and that around that's another um, storage option for people whether it be sewing or whether it be for another type of hobby just to be able to keep mm. their things together and, together. and move them yeah. around that's fabulous. This one we're looking at is again. This is another type of. This is a portable stitching frame. So this could be used where again very similar to the to the crocheting frame, but a little bit of a different design. And this you allows you to actually stretch uh, a, again a piece of um, of, uh, of material over the frame and will actually hold it in place. The good thing about this particular product is this can actually be used on a table or on your lap. Mm -hmm. The way that it's um, the way that it's designed, it, it will actually uh, sit on a lot of different services. Um, and these type, there's a few different types of these products. This one's this one's made of wood, but can, you can get them. You can actually get them made of plastic and that as well. The knitting aid on the right is actually a really uh, a popular product, and and uh, there's actually a lot of these around on the internet and a lot of people actually like using these. So this can be used if somebody um, has a lot of um, discomfort, for example, when they're knitting, the actual motion of knitting, they get um, they get a little bit tired, for example, when they're knitting, knitting for, for quite a long time. But this particular product is also good for, for those who have sustained a loss of movement in one arm, for example. Mm -hmm. So it actually keeps the needles in a, in, a, um, in a position when a break is needed. So, for example, because the needles are attached to the end of the, um, to the, end of the aid, as you can see, when you actually, if you want to let go of the needles to have a little bit of a break or something like that, you won't actually mm -hmm. you lose all the, the the stuff that you've already knitted, and the needles won't come. That's the knitting right. needles won't come apart. And it's also designed that you can actually flip it over if you want to start a new row, for example. You can act, all you have to do is flip it over. Great. And it will yes, start a new row. Out. Yeah, rather than having to change the, the, the needles, for example. Yeah, that's terrific. That's great. And, Peter, what about if um, board games or cards are the things that people enjoy? Board games is, um, following you say that, when I was doing a lot of research for, for this webinar too, as well as stuff that we have on our website as well, I found some interesting stuff when it came to, to, to looking at board games so when we look at games and, and things like that, a lot of the um, a lot of the assistive technology when it comes to designing board games now on the market generally have a lot to do with, with the size of print, print sizing and text sizing and things like that. Okay. Um, so simple um, things like, for example, we'll look at some bingo cards, for example, and cardboards. So, for example. 
you can get different types of, of, of bingo cards and also um, board games as well in different sizes. Mm -hmm. So if you're somebody that likes to go to bingo, for example, um, or like, you know, go down to your local club every week and plays bingo, for example, this is something that they may be able to do as well in just something like providing um, bigger bingo cards, for example, or, or yeah. cards with bigger text on them. So so for somebody that, that has um, issues with their eyesight, so just, just something that makes text a little bit bigger. You know, things like these are quite easy to do. You can either print them yourself or you can actually buy these sort of things from um, website as well, bigger tech sort of boards as well. A lot, there's a lot of things on the market as well that come in Braille, for example. Um, mm -hmm. that, the, that picture in the middle is actually of a large print Braille Scrabble board where the actual Scrabble pieces um, uh, come with large print and actually have raised braille letters and values on them hmm. um so that might be something that might help a lot of people as well having a bigger tile so even hmm. if uh, even if you even if you don't need the uh, um the braille feature of something like this hmm. you may just like the, the bigger tile and having yes. that and having that dexter and having that um that different surface and that different sort of feel to it might help you as well. Mm. Um, and then and then something as simple as jumbo playing cards. So when I was having a look at around, playing cards is something that a lot of manufacturers are now are starting to make in bigger sizes and in different yeah, sorts yeah. of um, configurations. Yeah. Sort of That's 10, great. 20 years ago, most, most playing cards sort of came out in very small sort of standard sizes, but now yes. you can get them, yeah. Now you can actually get them quite big. And and um, and also having a bigger card might help somebody with, uh, with hand function issues as well. A bigger mm -hmm. card might be a little bit easier to hold as well as to mm -hmm. see. Things such as card holders, for example, might be really good. I, I actually, um, I actually use a card holder myself. I know that because I have um, because I have function issues with my hands, I have trouble holding any more than five playing cards in my hand. And there's a lot of games out there that that that, that require you to hold. Cards. Yeah, a lot of playing cards in your hand. So yeah. so there's there's a range of, of different types of card holders out there. So the first one is a, a rectangular clear plastic card holder. So this might be for suitable for somebody that only has one hand to use, for example. Obviously, um, you know, when when you're using a cold a um a card holder like this, you probably don't want somebody you're playing and get sitting next to you. But um, but but these um put, put these your barriers up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um the second one, which is a deluxe round playing card holder, this one is slightly different. So this one is good for somebody who can um, who still has the hand function to actually hold cards in their hands, but has mm -hmm. trouble with the amount of cards that they're holding. So this this um this this plane, this disc, if you want to call it, allows you to insert the playing cards in one side of the um, of the of the device. It actually has a groove in the end of it. It's made of rubber, has a groove in the end of it, and you can slot the cards into the end of it um, mm -hmm. and still hold them in your hand upright. So um, this might be something that might be good for you as well when you're you need something to help you hold cards. The last one is again a, is will assist you in um, actually sh shuffling cards. I know it's something I can't do, and it frustrates me to no end because I know whenever I'm playing cards with somebody, especially especially if you, it's only two two of you playing, and you're asking the other person to deal all the time, means they're now effectively having to shuffle and deal every hand for you. Yeah. Yep. 
And he's we actually got one of these when our boys were young because they were struggling with shuffling the cards. So we ha they're good for kids as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and these are, I've seen these everywhere. You can buy them in um, can buy them in card. Your novelty shops sell them. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I've seen them in two dollar shops, for example. Um, okay. As well, as well as you know, um, board game shops and 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 uh, and and uh, sort of shops as well as online. But yeah. um, this one here, like most of them, is battery operated. Um, this particular one will actually shuffle two decks for you, um, and one deck in each side. I think you can get single deck shuffling machines as well. But yeah. um, I know they're actually quite expensive. They're not. Uh, Quite a good, inexpensive option uh, for people to um, shuffle cars and things like that. Hmm. That's great. And then, Peter, we were talking before we started the program, we, we were wondering about photography. So what about when photography is someone's passion? And I should say, too, we recently, we have an art show every year. And photography features a lot in our art show. So I, I know a lot of people with MS pursue photography as a hobby. And so it's great to know there are some things to help them if they're struggling. Yeah, absolutely. I think when um, photography was, photography is not an area that's a big interest in mine. So I, I actually did quite a bit of research when it came to, to sort of so looking at, at, at particular options to present to you guys today. So I'm sort of learning as, as, as well as you guys are as That's well. Right. Yeah. Um, so a lot of, um, I know when, um, you know, in, in days gone, I remember when I was growing up, you know, um, 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 I had a number of family members that liked taking photos, but all the, all the, all the cameras, all the cameras used to be big and bulky, and I, I mean, as uh, I even had trouble sort of holding them. So, but now you've got a lot of different technologies and different cameras on the markets now. On the market now, so so now you've got the the GoPro, for example, that's out on the market now, which is actually really good. And I've, I've actually got a lot of friends, particularly in wheelchairs, that actually love using this because it's so small. Um, and you can take it anywhere, whether it be underwater or um, you can you can drop them, and 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 they're quite and um, they're quite actually quite a robust device. So um, the GoPros are actually uh, a really good camera option that are on that, that's actually on the market now for people. So the first one that I chose is actually a GoPro with what they call a gooseneck flexible mount. So there's obviously you know many and very different types of, of camera mounts on the market but this particular this particular one allows you to bend it and manipulate it in different angles right. so something like this might be really good attached to a wheelchair for example um so you you might be pushing the wheelchair along and filming something at the same time for example so having mm. this sort of mount will now allow you to to keep the, the camera on your wheelchair, but be able to move it around different angles to, to, to shoot different things you might be looking at, looking for. This particular mount um, is can quite easily be attached to literally anything. Um, Looks like it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As long as you've got something uh, um, um, secure to, to attach it to. So the second one's actually, again, is for a Go, GoPro, but this is actually a mini tripod. This one can be used either standing upright as a, as, as a tripod or can be or can be used as a, a handheld stick, for example. Um, right. And a lot of these sort of devices are telescopic, so you can change the length of them as well and walk around with them and hold them in your hand. Or you can use them in in the tripod form and, and, and sit it down in front of you, for example. Fabulous. This is one as well, as well as as well as for um, obviously GoPros, you can get tripods and these these sort of things as well, full regular regular cameras as well. So it doesn't really matter mm. what, what sort of camera you're using. And the, th the, the third one I've chosen, which is uh, an infrared remote control for a camera as well. 
So again, it's it's not only for, you know, something like remote control could be used for a lot of things. Could be used for taking pictures at a distance, for example, or, you know, wanting mm. to have yourself in the shot as well. So rather than using a, a, um, a countdown timer on the actual camera, having a, a, a remote control in your hand might be really good as well. Um, mm. Might also be a good option if, You've got an existing camera, um, you, you don't really want to or you can't really afford to go out and purchase purchase an, an, an another camera, for example, but you might have trouble um, utilising the buttons on the camera, for example, whereas a remote control might have bigger buttons for you and, and might have all of the camera functions on the remote as well for it's. Uh, easier for you to use. So a remote control is a good option as well to, to use anything. Um, there's a lot of, also too, when we come, when we talk about remote controls, there's actually a lot of um, mobile phone apps on the market as well that will actually control devices as well, whether it be cameras or TVs or anything that uses utilises Bluetooth. So um, mm. So those are, you know, those are really good options as well. Looking, looking at, at 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 the different phone applications that are around as well to control different types of devices. Mm. I was just um, going to say I've got my mobile phone set to take a photo when I say smile. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you know, a, a lot of um, phone apps as well will, can will work on voice recognition as well. So, yeah, even Siri and Google, for example, uh, might be able to say, you know, mm. hey, Siri, take a photo, Do take a photo of me. Um, and sort of having those verbal commands as well is good for, good for a lot of people, as an option for a lot of people as well. So this one is, again, just another telecopic, telescopic tripod scan just for a generic camera rather than something like a GoPro. Um, and also when we something that I never really thought about until someone pointed out to me a couple of weeks ago was was the fact that, that there's now drone drone camera options as well around now too, which will allow people to um, to fly a drone and, and be able to take photos or attach to it as well. So these are really good for if you're um, you want to take a photo in, in a location that you can't particularly get to. So if you want to take a landscape photo or something like that, but there might be some rocky terrain or there might be some trees or something that you can't physically get to that that mm. spot or that site to take a photo. Something like a drone might be really handy. They're That's really great. good at getting into those spots that people can't necessarily get to, to take yeah. photos. And um, the other thing, when it comes to drones as well, is just reminding people too that um, that there's a lot of, when, you, when, when you're talking about losing something like a drone, there's a lot of regulations around drone flying and things like that now as well. You know, there's a lot of mm. regulations around where you can fly them, how high you can fly them, mm. and those sort of things. I'll just I'll just mention that that if anybody's look anybody looks like going into the area of drone flying, whether it be whether it be as a professional cameraman or some or just just recreationally as well, um, probably have a look at the CASA website, which is the Civil mm. Aviation Authority. They have a lot of guidelines around recreational drone use and what those regulations are. So that's that's something that you might, you might want to have a look at. Yeah. Thinking back to the art show, Peter, I, so many people are into painting and drawing. There are lots of gadgets to help with painting and drawing. Oh, painting and drawing and another area that, um, that again, I'm, I'm, I'm somebody that's not better. <laughs> It's never really been an artistic person, but I know a lot, a lot of my friends that are. And I get, I myself even get astounded by, you know, the types of ingenious things that my friends have, have come up with and used to, to allow them to keep painting um, 
I know I've I've um, I've got a friend that actually lives in New Zealand. He's actually a professional foot what a professional foot and mouth painter, and he actually yeah, paints. Yeah, he actually paints with the the paintbrush in his mouth. Yep. And he's actually a really good painter. He's actually so, he's actually made a lot of money for his painting as well. So, and it was That's something fun. I remember when when um, when he actually took it up, which is probably about 15, 20 years ago now. It was painting was something that that after he's uh, had his injury, he never thought he'd be able to do again. Um, so yes. um, yeah, absolutely. So from seeing him back then to to now actually actually selling paintings is just it was That's just fabulous. absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So when it comes to paintbrushes, we can get paintbrushes in various sizes and various thicknesses, for example. This particular the first paintbrush is actually a paintbrush with a nylon bristle bristle and actually has a, a short, thick wooden handle on it. So you can get different paintbrushes, again, of different lengths, different thicknesses, depending on what you prefer to, to hold on to. You might even, you might even, if you don't want to go, if you don't want to go that way, you might even just be able to wrap something around your existing paintbrush just to make it a little mm. bit thicker be able to hold mm. whether it be a bit of sponge on the end or um, a couple of layers of tape for example mm. so, okay the second picture is actually a, a big egg handled um, brush so this is actually a, an ergonomic wooden handle on this particular brush and that actually has two flat sides on it so the flat sides of the handle are designed to prevent the paint brush from rolling when you're sitting it on the table, for example, yep. and keep and it keeps the head of the brush off the table surface when it's not being used. So uh, something like this might be might be easier for you to hold and grasp onto as well as being a little bit shorter. And then we, we we've got roller options as well as paint brushes as well. So we. Um, Something like a roller is actually could actually quite e quite easy to use where you've only got the rolling, the forward and backwards motion. So that might be a, another good option as well if you get if you get tired a little bit easier, for example, or you don't have the um, the hand dexterity to actually hold a paintbrush, or you find that quite difficult. Um, painting with a roller mm. might be a good option as well. Um, Mm. As good as, as as well as it 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 actually covering more more of a surface as well, um, which will allow you to actually paint more as well. So that's another good alternative mm. as well to a um to a paintbrush. Mm, that's terrific. Absolutely. So when it comes to actually ho um, holding in place our the paper that we're painting on or whatever the surface is we're painting on. You might look at something like an easel. So this one is actually a see-through easel, which is actually mounted on a wooden frame and it can be used for drawing, painting um, or writing. These sorts of easels, you know, the, the various ones on the market that are different sizes and have different leg configurations as well. So uh, something like this might be a good option for you as well. Then we look at something like a soft pencil grip. So if you're if you're somebody, for example, that has has problems with um, holding pencils or pens or uh, textures or crayons or or anything that you want to write or draw with, for that matter, a grip, an ergonomic grip, a contoured ergonomic grip might might be a good option for you. So you, mm. it's just Placing the pen or the pencil in, in, into the grip for for a bit more for a bit more comfort when it comes to your finger grip as well might be easier for you to 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 hang on to as well. So these types of grips again come in different shapes and sizes as well that are on the market. So it's just a matter of finding something that that, that might work well for you. Um, again, quite an inexpensive option. So. It might be something that that you can afford. You might be able to afford to buy and try, and 
if you don't like it or it doesn't suit you, so see what else is on the market as well. And then the last one is a different writing aid. So this is a slip on the writing aid. So this is a, a contoured aid made of plastic that fits over the user's hand. So in this case, while you're using your fingers to actually guide the pen or the pencil, you may not have the strength to actually um, push down on the pencil so that it actually mm -hmm. writes on the bit of paper. So um, this particular device al allows you to use your hand function to um, as a way of, of um, putting pressure with that, that pencil on, on the paper as well. Mm -hmm and move the hand around so again this might be another option that's um that's good for you um this one is a um this, this particular writing aid is actually one available for the for the, for the right hand as well so mm -hmm. yeah there's a left-handed option and a right-handed option as well so just a couple of just a couple of other things that, that that I thought you guys might be interested to. I know I know a lot of people are interested in pottery and, and from time to time I get a lot of sort of questions about that. So um, this actual this pottery wheel is actually um, is actually height adjustable and is actually attached to uh, is actually attached to the table. So um, um, because it's on a height adjust because it's a height adjustable potting wheel will allow, uh, allow somebody to use it from a sitting position or in a wheelchair as well as being in a standing upright position as well mm. so it just allows you to controls on the table as well that will be actually actually uh, yeah, allow you to adjust the speed of the wheel as well Right, where where it's most pottery wheel, most generic pottery wheels are used with a um, uh, with a foot pedal. This one yes. actually has con controls on the table as well that will allow That's you to great. actually control yeah the the pottery wheel by hand, and they can be sort of controlled by a second person too if if required if you're you're uh, you're needing assistance as well with with um, doing pottery or something like that as well. And then the last, last of all, the one I chose is just an, it's a um, fully electric sit stand desk. So again, this 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 is a desk that can be used for anything that you're wanting to do. Uh, it just allows you to electronically adjust the height of the desk rather than rather than getting the desk, for example, that that might be manually adjustable. Um, with holes yeah. or something like that. This is just a table that allows you to electronically operate the height of the desk. You can use it for sitting or standing use and it's a push button control operation. So um, it's quite easy to use to adjust the height of it as well. Or the, this one, you can actually program it too to actually uh, program the actual height of it as well. So, um, okay. Yeah, so if, if you've got set heights or set positions you want your table in, you can um, just press a button and it will go to that desired height as well. So there's tables like that that, that have memory functions on the market as well. That's fabulous, Peter. I, I, I just love how you've um, put together a whole variety of ideas and different things that might be suitable for different people depending on what their issue is. And as we said at the start, that's really what we want to highlight to people, that there are so many different reasons why your hobby might be impacted, but equally so many different solutions. So th that idea of being able to sit or stand to do activities is fabulous as well. So thank you for including those. And here's the dreaded fatigue conversation, because we we know how much fatigue is an impact and an issue for people, particularly living with multiple sclerosis. And we run a whole lot of programs around managing fatigue, so I'd encourage you to tap into those. But when it comes to doing your hobbies, the things we would probably remind you of are the, the strategies around pacing. So making sure that when you when you're giving yourself time to do your hobby, you also build in some rest breaks and you don't just expect to do the, the activity for the whole day. You might actually give yourself a time frame 
for doing your hobby and even because it can be really um, absorbing and you might get into a flow with your hobby but you might know that if you do spend too long on it you, you will suffer for that later so maybe you need to set yourself a timer and have 15 minutes painting and then go and do something else then come back to your painting so you're breaking it up there's a whole idea of simplifying the task so looking for ways that you can make the make the performance of your hobby easier can you buy pre-cut fabric can you buy pre-mixed paint colors you know things that might simplify the process and as I've already mentioned, remembering to incorporate rest breaks into your hobby so that you can continue doing more. So all the same fatigue strategies that you'd use at other times, you can also apply to doing your leisure activities as well. So Peter, where can people get more advice around their assistive technology options? Yeah, thanks, Andrea. So what I, what, what I like to tell a lot of people is that when it comes to um, when it comes to to, to choosing the, the best of city technology for us, there's no better there's no better purse there's no better person that knows what we need other than than ourselves, for example. So I always tell people that the the best place to find out about products and things like that is actually through our peers, through our friends, mm -hmm. finding out what our friends. Um, use to do a particular task. Um, some, some somebody might have, might have come across something that that you might think, oh, you know, that, that'd be good for me to try. So using our peers and our friends is is a good way of, of finding out what's around with with different ways of doing things, different types of assistive technology. Um, social media is another good avenue. I know for those of you that that, that utilise Facebook, there's a little, there's I know there's a lot of different disability related Facebook groups popping up and clubs and hobby interest groups and travel interest groups and, and various different groups that people can join and, and, and become part of where people share ideas and things like that. So social media is a good avenue as well. Things like online forums. Um, a lot of organisations might have um, memberships where they might have online forums and things like that. So that's another way of, of, of people talking to each other and finding out what's out there as well. As well as your conventional, in conventional formal support. So, you know, um, something like talking to your occupational therapist, for example, might be a good idea as well, particularly if you're unsure about your level of function and what type of things that might work for you. So um, talking to your, your occupational therapist might be a good idea as well as uh, assistive technology mentor, such as myself, for example, someone who's got lived experience, same as same as one of, of, of your peers has, has uh, might have some good ideas as well on what they use as well, as well as, um, as I said, assistive technology Australia and other independent living centres as well might be uh, might be a good option. So a combination of all of those things is is, is a really good support. And sort of the other the other areas of the sort of formal assessment as well, just generically might be a physiotherapist as well. So if you're somebody that 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 is either you know um, newly acquired your um, your disability or your level of function has just changed. Um, you, you know, you might want to see something like uh, someone like a physio to, to, to have a look at at at, um, at, um, at how you're doing things and how how you're moving about. And might be able to suggest some good products for you as well. Just a few useful resources. So um, there's the Recreation Age page of our assistive technology website, which a lot of the products that you've seen today are actually taken from as well as a lot of others as well. So that's a good place to, to, to definitely have a look at our website and see what we've got available as well. A um, couple of other things that I found. So um, Able Anglers is actually a, um, a fishing, they actually provide, um, provide fishing group tours for people with disabilities. They're actually based in South East Queensland. So I had a little bit of look at their website the other day. They've got a lot of lot of good resources and and, and ideas on 
on how people can 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 look at modifying things for fishing as well. So that might be a good resource as well as as there being, you know, various other fishing clubs and things around in your state that you might want to search for and other organisations doing things as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, just the, just the CASA website again for, for, for that yeah. recreational drain use and having a look at, at what those rules rules are around um, around drain use. And also just uh, the NDIS as well. So again, a lot of these types of equipment um, that you may need uh, for your for your participation in your hobbies uh, might be classified as as, as 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 low technology and again might might be able to um, to buy out of your core funding in your NDIS pinch for example and you may not need an assessment for so um, I've just put that there as a reference for you guys as well so yeah just as how, how to fund equipment so um, I had a fund on my equipment, so you've got the NDIS. So if you're, as I said, men just mentioned, if you're an NDIS participant, a lot of these things are, are low tech and a low cost um, options. Which, if you're self managed or plan managed, for example, you might just be able to purchase from your from your core support, depending on the level of, of technology that you need. If it's something like a modified wheelchair or a beach wheelchair or something that's a little bit more expensive you may need to get an assessment for it so just check with your um, your LAC about that obviously DVA is an, an, an option as well for those that if you're not on the NDIS but you, um, you utilize the Department of Veterans Affairs if you want to go you go to a white card that may be an option as well again just check with um, with your contacts there to see if, if they can actually provide assistance as well, and as, and also the um, the scholarships through um, multiple scholarships, particularly the gold the gold scholarships. Yes, they are. That, that's an annual program, the Go for Gold scholarships. And something else that occurred to me too, as we were talking, Peter, is sometimes these pieces of equipment are the sorts of things that a local Rotary Club would love to support someone with. So, you know, sometimes it's think laterally as well, where you can get yeah. some financial support for some of these pieces of equipment. That's great. Absolutely. So here's some contact details and well as well, so that you can contact Assist Australia or contact MS Connect. Thanks so much, Peter, for putting all those ideas together, because I think it really just reinforces the message that we want to get across that there, there are various reasons why you might be struggling with the hobby that you enjoy doing, but it's not a matter of just giving it away. Let's look together at ways that we can keep you doing the hobby that you enjoy, because there are so many benefits from having hobbies and pastimes. So don't That's let it. the conversation stop here either. Make sure that if something has, you know, has sparked for you, ask the question, make the phone call, ask someone for a bit more advice and a bit more support. Absolutely. And, and as I say to everybody, always, you know, uh, always ask yourself, you know, um, if you're thinking, I can't, I would really like to do this, but, you know, no, I, no, I can't do it. I'll never be able to do this. Always turn that around and think to myself, how can I do this? Not, don't tell yourself, I can't ask yourself how. That's wonderful, wonderful advice. Thank you so much for your time again in putting these, these slides together and for your time with us today. That's been just wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, India. But thanks for being part of today's program. There is opportunity if you want to ask a question. I've got a couple of comments uh, that have come through that I would love to share with you. We, I loved um, the interaction during the program of what hearing what you're involved in and what you find helpful. So let me just find a couple of these and feel free to type in. Um, Jackie was saying that she has put a small tactile dot from Vision Australia on her camera shutter button. And that's really helpful. So that's a great tip. Absolutely fantastic. Um, Stella had made the comment that she always looks at things sideways. And I thought that's a great 
that's a great way to, to think about it, isn't it? We need to look at things differently, not just take it on face value that this is how we do it, it's how we always have to do it. Uh, and Merowyn um, finds the tripod really helpful and a remote control when she's taking her macro photography of bugs and tiny stuff. So that just sounds fabulous too. So if there's any other comments or any other questions, feel free to pop them through. But again, I would just reinforce the idea that don't, don't let your MS get in the way of doing the things that you enjoy doing as much as you can help it. I have to, you know, we need to be honest too and recognise that there might be some things that become too unsafe or just unmanageable, but maybe we can shift our our hobby a little bit differently so that we are still involved in that thing that we enjoy so much. Uh, great comment, Yvonne. Yeah, Yvonne says she's never thought of applying for funding for her art practice because she's been going it alone for so long. NDIS is all about achieving your goals. So if you know if you can word your goal around the things that you enjoy doing and get value from, you should be able to get some funding in it. Uh, terrific. Um, Hel Helen had an interest around horse riding. And I so H Helen, email education at ms and .org.au and you can connect to Nicola Gray in that way. And some thank yous coming through as well. So again, thanks for being part of the program. It's always great hearing from people, hearing your tips and tricks as well. And I just reiterate what Peter said earlier, that your peers are often the best place to get ideas from other people who have tried different things. So reach out, whether it's through Facebook groups or whether it's by connecting to a peer support program through MS. There's great advice and support available. I look forward to seeing you at another webinar. Please just stay on for a minute after the webinar finishes to give us some feedback and also to put forward any ideas you have for future webinar topics. We're always interested to know what would be helpful and if there's a way of getting you that information. So thanks everyone for being online and I'm sure you join me in thanking Peter as well. I look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Bye for now.